Afternoon, folks. This is the beginning of our lesson on the Darwinian revolution. So for those of you in my history of science class, you might want to go on Blackboard, pull up the copy of the handout related to all this, summarizing some of the key concepts from the notes, as well as giving the names of the people involved and the dates of birth and death for most of them, which I will not always be giving in this lesson. I will not be talking about homework assignments or anything in here. This is strictly the content. So today we are going to be dealing with one of my personal favorite topics as an evolutionary biologist. We're going to be talking about the origins of evolutionary theory in the modern world, which of course culminates with the work of this good old fellow right here, Charles Robert Darwin, one of the most famous names in the history of science. Darwin, of course, is most remembered as the author of his famous work on the origin of species, in which he introduces the concept of evolution via natural selection. Now, you've seen in here repeatedly that most of the great ideas in science are not the work of one person, that most of these things are ideas that are being worked on by several people at once or building slowly over the course of time as a whole bunch of independent discoveries culminate in the pooling together of an overarching explanatory theory. Evolution is no exception. The concept of evolution isn't new, and it was not new to Darwin, nor did he make any pretense that it was, uh, that this was an idea <clears throat> that percolated through the biological sciences pretty much from their beginning, the idea of how life might in some fashion change over time. So this is in a lot of ways going to be a story about how we got to the bringing together of that overarching theory. You might have noted that oh, we say that there are three great scientific revolutions. You've heard about the Copernican revolution in which we arrived at the notion that the earth goes around the sun, the Newtonian revolution in which we arrived at the notion of consistent, uh, mathematically explicable physical laws that apply to everything in the universe. And now we're looking at the Darwinian revolution, which is going to culminate with an explanatory model of how life itself might adapt and change over time. Now you've seen that in a lot of cases, more than one person was working on the same model at the same basic time. You saw how many people were working on the basic ideas involving mathematics and motion that contributed to the Newtonian revolution. The Darwinian revolution is no big exception. A lot of people are thinking about this by Darwin's time. And the idea has been kicking around for a while at that point. Unlike with the uh, Newtonian revolution, however, there's not significant competition among most of the scientists involved here. A little bit, we'll talk about some of that where it comes up, but we're not looking at the race towards an evolutionary model in the same way that we were looking for at, say, a race towards calculus or a race towards gravitation. Uh, and there are a couple of social reasons for that, more than anything else having to do with the fact that this is a topic that is hard to talk about. Now, before we get to Darwin's story, let's back up a little ways and let's kind of lay some backdrop. You already know parts of the story because we've already been talking about evolutionary concepts throughout this course. Way back in classical Greece, we saw that one of the first named philosophers Anaximander of Miletus gave us an evolutionary theory in the 7th century BCE, uh, well, 6th century BCE by the time he introduced it, I suppose, uh, in which he suggested an idea that life originated in the oceans and was transformed into more complex forms by the vital heat of the sun. The later philosopher Empedocles <coughs> is going to offer up an idea of evolutionary change involving random body parts connecting in the primal oceans, favorable combinations surviving, and unfavorable combinations dying off, a very crude form of natural selection that helped him to explain phenomena such as the appearance of strange looking prehistoric fossils that didn't look like any animals alive in his own day. Aristotle, of course, uh, is going to be one of the early founding fathers of the biological sciences. He's not going to talk in terms of change, uh, but what he's going to talk about is the scala naturae, this ranking of living things into a hierarchy of forms, a crude taxonomy based on the perception of whether an organism was blooded or bloodless, whether that organism had a rational soul, a nutritive soul, or a uh, sensitive soul. Uh, and the concept of 
how much vital heat an organism produced, which ranked them from the highest at humans all the way down to the lowest of plants and worms. So all of these are ideas that are informing early classical biology, and some of them are even poking at the question of is life static or does life change over time? We're going to see that in the Islamic Middle Ages, people such as Al-Jahiz and Nasir al-Tusi are going to offer up evolutionary ideas that are in many ways comparable to what we have now, introducing concepts such as adaptation and a struggle for existence and even a food chain although neither of their ideas is going to become widely known in the West until long after those notions have been independently explored by Western scientists. Not really theft in this case, just simple ignorance here. But you might have noticed as we've proceeded throughout this course that I have not spent a lot of time on the biological sciences or the geological sciences. Most of the science we've been exploring in here, at least since the Renaissance, has dealt with physics, astronomy, chemistry, uh, where we've talked about biology, it's almost always been in the context of medicine. I mentioned a few geological or biological people here and there where they became relevant to our stories. Of course, um, the use of the microscope by Van Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke, you know, gave us our first picture of microbiology in the beginnings of cell theory. We talked a little bit about geology and paleontology with the works of people like Nicholas Steno. But for the most part, these are topics that we've not given a lot of attention to. And this is not a coincidence. The life sciences, in a lot of ways, are going to lag behind other areas of scientific progress during the Renaissance. Why is this? A couple of reasons. For starters, we have the fact that until the invention of the microscope, biology is a really hard subject to look at empirically. We are not in a position to understand the fundamental units of life. And as such, we're not really in a good position to interpret how living things are put together and how they really work at a biomechanical level. So until we had the beginnings of cell theory in the mid to late 1600s uh, with the invention of the microscope, frankly, biology couldn't get very far. Similar problem we have here is that biology in a lot of ways is a form of fancy chemistry. You as a biological system are a blob of chemicals obeying a whole bunch of physical and chemical rules. Until we had an empirical science of chemistry, and until we had enough physics to understand things like how motion could come about without uh, having it just be impelled by uh, a soul or a teleological purpose, or how we could understand how living things function energetically with the understanding of bioelectricity, in the absence of those basic discoveries in physics and chemistry, even when we knew that cells existed, we were in no position to theorize about how they did what they did. So the life sciences, frankly, suffer from the lack of a good toolkit in the other physical sciences. And until that toolkit becomes really elaborated in the 18th and even into the 19th centuries, there's some sharp limits on what biology as a science can do. It is not a coincidence that we find the biological sciences really taking off during the 19th century, because that is precisely when we're learning enough chemistry to begin understanding exactly how cells work, and therefore for the first time to begin explaining at more than an observational level about how living systems function. Most of the biological work we have done up till this point, therefore, has fallen into two categories. One, medical. Uh, medicine has, of course, always been relevant to human affairs, uh, but in the absence of, again, microscopy or understanding of bacteria or understanding of physiology, most medicine has been very practical rather than theoretical, uh, hands-on applied medicine, if you will, not a lot of strong medical theory, more just, okay, here's what's happening to you, here's how we fix it. Where there is theory, it is mostly dealing with what are the causes of pathology. And even then, we don't really have a way to learn a lot about that until the 19th century when we start getting into bacteriology and germ theory. Even then, we don't know about viruses till the early 1900s. So biology kind of had to wait for other branches of science to catch up before it could really become a well-formulated 
empirical field. Therefore, most of the biological science we are going to see up until about the 1700s is going to be descriptive. It's going to be largely in the forms of people describing what they see in nature, saying, okay, here are these organisms, here is what they do, here is how they look. Uh, a lot of field study kind of research, if you will. We find that uh, a lot of this is in the tradition of er people like Aristotle and al Jahiz, who wrote extensive manuals on plant and animal life. Remember, think of things like Aristotle's uh, history of animals or on the parts of animals. <coughs> think of al Jahiz's own version of history of animals, the Kitab al Hayawan. Think of Theophrastus's inquiry into plants and on the causes of plants. These are largely descriptive texts. In a lot of cases, they're they're very limited in what they can do. People like the Roman encyclopedist Pliny the Elder are talking about a lot of animals and plants in, his, in the natural history that they've never personally seen. They're relying on other people's accounts. They're relying on descriptions, sometimes on a preserved specimen, sometimes on a lot of hearsay. It is not terribly surprising that a lot of biologists take seriously the idea of things that we know today as mythological sorts of creatures like giants or centaurs or winged horses and so forth because they are accustomed to hearing strange descriptions of things from far off lands, things that uh, they're not really accurately describing. In the Middle Ages, there are what we call bestiaries, B-E-S-T-I-A-R-I-E-S. -E -E bestiaries are encyclopedias of beasts, if you will. They're collections of descriptions of animals. And a lot of what is in there is either secondhand descriptions uh, that <clears throat> the monk usually writing it uh, is relying upon of an animal that he's never seen, or speculation, usually coming from a very teleological perspective on why a thing would be happening. And therefore your bestiaries end up including some rather odd statements, some of which are easy to explain what observation you think that somebody is making. For example, the common belief uh, in the Middle Ages that lion cubs were born with no shape and their mothers licked them into shape. You can see why this would be. You're watching mama lion from a distance. You're not getting up close. If any of you ever seen newborn kittens, you know, they look an awful lot like little blobs, messy little blobs at first. And what's mama cat do? She licks them clean. And then when you see them when they're licked clean, they resemble you know, something you would call a cat a lot more. That's what we see happening with Mama Lion, and therefore observers thought that the baby lions had no shape until she licked them into their form. Some of the observations of medieval bestiaries are a little more inexplicable. For example, uh, the record found an account by an 11th century Irish monk suggesting that blue jays glow in the dark. I'm not sure where he got that one from. And you get things that are supposition based on the appearance of an animal or what we can say about it. For example, uh, accounts of travelers returning from Africa describing an animal that they called the camel leopard. The camel leopard is going to have a body plan kind of like a camel, but spots like a leopard. Of course, we are talking about a giraffe. But you can see why our medieval explorers observing a giraffe for the first time would see something that reminded them of both a camel and a leopard and give it that name accordingly. And before our modern understanding of biology, especially in a world that's full of mythological accounts of, you know, half bird, half lions, like griffins and things like that, it's not really all that surprising. Somebody might assume that a lion-camel hybrid could be a thing that might exist. So this is what we get with our very crude early biology, mostly descriptive, mostly observational, and a lot of times secondhand observational, and a lot of poor conclusions on the basis. Appeal to authority, of course, matters here as well, up until we start doing away with the old uh, scholasticism of saying, well, Aristotle said it, so it must be true. We are dealing with the fact that a lot of our scholars are relying on the accounts of what other people have previously said and assuming that the previous author knew what they were talking about. And that lasts a lot longer in biology, which as I remind you again, is not a thing we have a lot of toolkit to test with than it does in the more crunchy sciences where anybody can roll a ball down a slope or drop a rock off a tower and measure what's happening. So that's one reason the biosciences are gonna lag. The other reason the biosciences are going to lag is a paradigmatic one. 
not so much with the toolkit available for study as with the way we are thinking about it. For the most part, most natural historians, the term which is still in use at this time, natural history, doesn't come to be called biology till the 19th century, uh, most natural historians are not really thinking about the study of life in terms of explaining how it works. For the most part, they're thinking of it as a descriptive field for the simple reason that it's often thought there's no good reason to account for how it works. It's easy for us to sit in our modern perspective and say, well, nobody believed in evolution. It's not so much that nobody believed in evolution, it's that the concept of evolution wasn't even being discussed. No one's even thinking in terms of an evolutionary process for the most part up until the relatively recent past. And the reason for that is because the average European scholar is thinking that question has already been answered. Because keep in mind that up in, until the very recent past, even your average well-educated scientist is assuming the literal truth of the Christian Bible and therefore that the book of Genesis tells us everything we need to know about the origins of life. So your average natural historian is taking as a given that God plunked down animal life on the planet and plant life and all other life in exactly the form that we see it today, that there was a great flood that wiped out everything and then you know everything that came there was what survived on the Ark of Noah. Uh, and basically that life in terms of its origins was simply whatever divine creation put down. So there's not a feeling that there needs to be a lot of theory in biology because the big question it is presumed has already been answered. We already know where life came from because we have a Bible to tell us that. And we're not thinking in terms of life changing and adapting over time because God made life exactly as it needs to be, right? Why would we need to worry about that? So <clears throat> we're not investigating the origins of life. We're not investigating the fundamental mechanism of adaptation and evolutionary change because no one's thinking in terms of that being necessary. It simply wouldn't occur to most natural historians to ask those questions yet. And in the absence of evolution as a unifying theory for the biological sciences, I don't need to tell you biology folks listening how vitally important that is. In the absence of that, there are a lot of questions we cannot answer in biology and a lot of questions we can't even ask. So we're basically missing both a toolkit and a philosophical mindset that will let us investigate the biological sciences with the rigor that is being given to chemistry and physics and other more mathematically oriented physical sciences. Same goes for geology in a way. Geology, like biology, is held back by the absence of a solid empirical toolkit. Until we have some solid chemistry under our belts, advancing geology becomes pretty hard to do because we don't really have a good understanding of the minerals and the chemical actions involved in their manipulation. Until we have better mathematical and physical techniques for understanding how landforms might adapt and change over time, Fields like plate tectonics and geomorphology aren't even a thing we can think about. And until the age of exploration, there are a lot of kinds of terrain out there that Western scholars have quite simply never seen or thought about. So geology is limited by the lack of a solid empirical toolkit as well. Even more so than biology, geology is also held back by a perception of divine creation as being the source of change. The idea that God made the land, made the seas, and made all these landforms exactly the way they are. Given the slowness of geological change, the average person has not experienced the geological change, has not really gotten to see the movement of a glacier or the separation of continental plates or anything like that. It's not going to occur within anybody's lifetime. It's not going to occur within the lifetime of civilizations for the most part. When we do see geological change happening, what do we see? We see catastrophic change, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, rock slides, avalanches, floods, 
big scale, huge, sudden, cataclysmic events. In other words, pretty solid Wrath of God kind of stuff. And that is not doing anything to disabuse anyone of the notion that the divine hand is the primary force that is shaping the earth. So we've got this perception that, again, the book of Genesis tells us exactly how the world got here, that the flood of Noah, as you've seen several previous scholars suggest, is responsible for carving the land into its current configuration, and that major geologic upheavals are the result of divine action. And until we have some solid physics to begin investigating things like why you might get a volcanic eruption or an earthquake in the absence of the hand of God reaching in to punish people, there's not much else to work with, and most folks are taking the Bible as a literal truth anyway, where you find this kind of thing as a result of divine action. The upshot of all this, folks, is that a combination of lingering belief in the literal truth of the book of Genesis coupled with the gradual growth of better scientific tools to investigate everything, means that the life sciences and the earth sciences have not really had a whole lot of way to advance. But that's not going to last. As we get further and further into the age of reason and uh, the enlightenment and beyond, well, the toolkits have been laid down. Chemistry and physics are growing. We're now getting better ways to analyze reality. We're getting better tools to look at cells and the chemical processes of both life and of the earth itself. We're getting a more and more empirical mindset that is less willing to admit of divine causation for major events, and that even scientists who are believers in the divine are still, for the most part, wanting to look for physical rather than spiritual explanations for natural phenomena. So we're going to find that once we get into the 17 and 18, uh, 17 and 1800s, 18th and 19th centuries, that there's a growing willingness by scientists to begin inquiring deeply into the earth and life sciences, and a growing awareness that maybe there are causes here to be seen beyond scripture. So that is our backdrop, folks. That's how we're going into this. And what I'm going to be giving you today is not, strictly speaking, a study of the Darwinian Revolution. It is going to be a study of the things leading up to it, culminating in Darwin's landmark work. He was not the first evolutionary scientist. He was not the last. So our lecture today is going to be a little bit more geographically broad in scope than what I've mostly been giving you, where I tend to focus on one century or so at a time. This is going to stretch over a wide area, and we're going to be slowly building up the stories of both the earth sciences and the life sciences, because as you're going to see, those developments are very closely intertwined for all the reasons I've already given. So where do we begin? Let us begin this discussion by framing the perspective of a lot of our scholars. And so let's start with the work of a fellow who is not in any way a scientist, but ends up being important to our story. And this is an Irish clergyman by the name of the Archbishop James Usher. Usher spelled U-S-S, -S, two S's, H-E-R. Usher was born in 1581, died in 1656. He's an Anglican priest. He holds the title of Primate of All Ireland, meaning he's the highest ranking Anglican priest in Ireland. Not a scientist, but he becomes interested in an important topic that matters a lot to both life and earth sciences. The question of how old is the world? Nobody really has a good answer to this, folks. And keep in mind that we're living in a time period in the 1600s here when a lot of the ancient civilizations that we have talked about in earlier stages of this class are basically unknown to even well-educated scholars. Keep in mind that the ancient languages of Sumeria and Babylon are not going to be translated until the 19th century. Same with Egypt. Uh, that a lot of these works are only known from second-hand accounts by other ancient classical authorities who are writing in Greek and Latin that are still well known. And as such, Sumeria, Assyria, Babylon, these early societies, many of their achievements are lost and forgotten. Nobody even really knows how far back they go. The only basis that most people historian or scientist have in this time period for even beginning to answer the question of how old is the world is biblical scripture. So 
the Archbishop James Usher undertakes to figure out how old the world is. He works on this problem for much of the latter part of his life. And the basic idea he's thinking is, all right, I got me a Bible here. I know when uh, Mr. Jesus Christ was born because it's the year 16 whatever, right? You know, I can count back to one. We know the first year of that calendar. I mean, setting aside for the fact that people like Johannes Kepler, even in this same time period, are thinking that the date of the birth of Christ might be a little bit off, but that's another issue. Anyhow, though, Usher is like, okay, I know what year it is now, so I know when Jesus was born. And thanks to the Old Testament of the Bible, I have a genealogy going from Joseph of Arimathea back and back and back through centuries of patriarchs and prophets and so forth, all the way back to Adam. And if you read the Old Testament, you know a lot of it is genealogy. It's stories of, okay, who begat whom, you know, and who were the children of this prophet and the children of that prophet. And yeah, you can trace through the Old Testament a lineage, a genealogy, a family tree that goes from the supposed first man all the way up to the supposed father of Jesus. Well, mortal father of Jesus. You, you know what I mean. So, point is, Usher says, I can think about this. I know what year it is now. I know how long it's been since Jesus. And because I have a genealogy, I can estimate how long it's been before Jesus till the moment of creation. Using a formula that he completely pulled out of his own ass, Usher is going to calculate how old the biblical patriarchs are when they had their children. And therefore, estimate, okay, how far back can I go? How old can I find the world to be? He actually does not finish the calculation before his death, but one of his disciples continues it after his death. And thus, uh, the, uh, in year 1658, two years after Usher's death, a posthumous book by him is published by his acolytes, a book with a mouthful of a title, Annales Veritas Testamenti a Prima Mundi Origini Deducti, or Annals of the Old Testament Deduced from the First Origins of the World. In this text, based on the genealogy of kings, patriarchs, and other important biblical figures, Usher's math ultimately leads to the conclusion that the world was created on Sunday, October the 23rd of the year 4004 BC, shortly after nightfall. Very precise calculation here. By the way, among other things, that means the earth is a Libra. Make of that what you will. All right, so Usher has worked out this very precise date in which he says, okay, the world is just a little bit shy of 6,000 years old. The world was created in about 4,000 BC, 4,004 BC, October 23rd. We can celebrate its birthday if we want to. So here's the thing. The average European at the time, whose only history sources or oldest history sources are biblical, says, okay, that makes sense. Sounds about right. About a 6,000 year old world. We can go with that. Science doesn't have a really better toolkit to say otherwise. And therefore, Usher's date of 4004 BC gets widespread acceptance. This becomes the default starting point for most scholars saying, okay, how old is the world? The simple fact of the matter is that nobody really has a better date to work with. And his works from a source that is generally considered authoritative. So that number, 4004 BC, gets ensconced in the popular imagination and in academia as the date of creation of the world. And therefore, that is the starting point for a lot of the people we're going to be talking about tonight when they are thinking about how old the world is. Now, I should point out that Usher's date started running into problems almost immediately, for, uh, namely within five years of the publication of his book, Christian missionaries returned from China for the first time and reported that Chinese civilization had written records that went back further than 4004 BC. Therefore, clearly showing that Usher's date was not correct. But the attitude of the average European confronted with this information was, oh, those people aren't white, what do they know? And therefore, that information was largely dismissed and Usher's date remained the one that stayed in the popular imagination. 
Now, I wish I could say that need has gone away. I mean, obviously now in modern biology and science, we know way better. <clears throat> the average person who doesn't know about the science still knows the world is at least millions of years old. All of y'all who are science folks in here probably are aware that the Earth is approximately four and one half billion years old, a number that Usher and his contemporaries could not have even begun to imagine, and one that science itself didn't arrive at till the invention of radiometric dating technologies in the early 1900s. I'll tell that story later. So, yeah, that date is clearly wrong by the most basic scientific standards we understand now, but you still hear it from time to time. Uh, I, in the course of my career as an evolutionary biologist and paleoanthropologist, often find myself on the front lines of the battle of defending evolutionary theory from people who, for whatever reason, still think that it's some pie-in-the-sky unproven idea. Uh, and that means that I am regularly confronted with uh, so-called young earth creationists telling me that everything I am saying is a lie and that I'm an atheist scumbag who's going to hell for believing that the world is older than 4004 BC. And some of these folks still hold to that date, believe it or not. I actually was on a radio program many years back. I was giving a talk on a radio program in Erie about uh, early research in human evolution. And they had a call-in segment, and people were calling and asking their questions. And this one dude calls in, and he says, so you were saying that, like, uh, um, Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in uh, western Pennsylvania, the oldest site of humans in the New World. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, shelter uh, Avella, Pennsylvania. By the way, once we're allowed to leave our houses and interact with other humans again, you might want to go check it out. Really cool archaeological site. I got to work on it early in my career. Oldest site of human habitation in the New World that we have confirmed so far. Goes back about 17,000 years. Pretty awesome site. Anyhow, though, uh, so this guy calls in, and we talked a little bit about Meadowcroft in the program. He's like, so it goes back 17,000 years, you said? And I said, yeah. And the guy goes, I don't understand how that can be, because isn't the world only 6,000 years old? And I'm like, oh crap, we're going here. And the thing is, he didn't sound like he was trolling me. He sounded earnestly confused. And I said, well, you know, we can hit the 6,000 year old mark at Meadowcroft early on, and we keep right on digging down, and we keep on finding more evidence of human habitation. So that number is not really going to work. The guy pauses for a minute. There's this long, quiet pause on the radio. And he's like, so these people who lived 17,000 years ago, would those have been pre-Adamite people? And that was not a concept I was heretofore aware of. And I said, well, the way we think about this in archaeology goes back a lot further. We have, you know, very solid archaeological techniques that push us way back further than 6,000 or way back further than 17,000 or way back further indeed than millions of years ago for the origins of mankind. And you can keep on digging down and keep finding more and more and more stuff. And the guy is like, oh, I gotta go. And I presumably gave him some things to think about for the day. But I digress. So Usher's date is our starting point for all of this. But let's start digging into some natural history. Let's start seeing what the natural historians themselves are doing and how we are going to little by little get to our more modern understanding of evolution and natural selection and geology along the way. So let's talk about a fellow you might not have heard of before. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But let's discuss for a few minutes an Englishman by the name of John Ray. Uh, Ray was born in 1627, died in 1705. He was, uh, in many ways, the greatest naturalist of his time. The word naturalist is often used along with natural historian as a person who goes out and studies the natural world. In a lot of ways, John Ray is kind of, for the biosciences, what Tycho Brahe was for astronomy. Namely, he's a guy who's not making blinding, groundbreaking discoveries. He is doing the patient yeoman's work of gradually, carefully, patiently documenting lots of natural phenomena to create a data set that's going to be the foundation of everybody else's work. Now, uh, by the way, you'll see that name spelled in a couple of different ways in contemporary records. Uh, John Ray, we usually spell it R-A-Y, but documents dating to his own time period talking about him also spell his name R-A-Y-E, 
or W-R-A-Y. So there is actually some reasonable confusion in scholarly circles about the proper spelling of his name, but R-A-Y is what you usually see. Now, John Ray, as compared to a lot of the people we haven't talked about in here, came from very humble origins. His father was a blacksmith. His mother uh, was a folk healer. Uh, he showed to have great academic gifts from a young age, and he managed to get admission to Cambridge University on a special scholarship for, quote, hopeful poor scholars, which basically meant young men of great academic promise who did not have the means to attend college, but they thought were worth sponsoring. So Ray did quite well at Cambridge. Uh, he finished his BA, became a fellow at Trinity uh, College within uh, the University of Cambridge, and gets very interested in the young field of botany, the study of plant life. Now, Ray became very frustrated by the absence of a solid classification scheme for the plant world and decided to build his own. Theophrastus had offered a very old one, but it wasn't really adequate by any modern standards. Now, Ray ended up having a difficult life. Uh, his poverty did not suit him well. Uh, he got into some political conflicts involving his church involvement. I should be calling him the Reverend John Ray. He was an Anglican priest, uh, and uh, he got em enmeshed in church politics and ended up losing his fellowship at Trinity University as a result of that, which would not have done well for his scholarly career in a time in which independent funding is not really a thing. Fortunately for Ray, he had managed to get a good reputation among his students by that time. And one of his students, a fellow by the name of Francis Willoughby, is going to take pity on Ray and say, teacher, I will help you out. I know you have important research you want to do. You've lost your fellowship, but I still believe in you. I will sponsor your research. I am independently wealthy. Let's work together, you and me, do some good natural history research. And I'll fund everything. I'll patronize you. I'll pay for your upkeep. You don't have to worry about it. Incidentally, if any of you are independently wealthy and looking to uh, fund and patronize a poor science historian, being an adjunct professor doesn't pay all that well. Come chat with me after the lecture. But uh, I digress. So Ray and Willoughby, as a partnership, are going to set out into the world. They are going to travel around Europe studying animals and plants in their natural habitats. In a lot of ways, Ray and Willoughby innovate the concept of field study as we know it right now, the idea of uh, going out into nature and directly studying animals and plants where they live to learn more about their habitat, their behavior, and their features. So, they're going to make an extensive study of plant life, traveling around Europe for several years. Ray is going to focus on the study of plants. Willoughby is going to focus on fishes, insects, birds, and beasts, which is a general term used for anything not in one of the previous categories, basically animal, uh, reptiles and mammals. Now, <clears throat> Willoughby, for his part, um, you might have heard that name before, and let me spell it. It's spelled oddly. Uh, W-I-L-L-U-G-H-B-Y. So Francis Willoughby, born in 1635, dies in 1672, uh, dies of a lung infection when he's only 37 years old. So he doesn't get to work with Ray for all that long. But the two men work quite well together and uh, put together a lot of solid research. And Ray continues to ride the Willoughby gravy train for the rest of his life. Because Willoughby, uh, after his death, he leaves in his will a home to John Ray uh, and uh, funds to continue his research. Basically, he leaves John Ray enough wealth that he can continue to be sponsored by Willoughby's fortune even after his death. John Ray moves into Francis Willoughby's home, and a few years later, he marries his widow. So Ray ends up completely co-opting Francis Willoughby's life and basically living off his fortune for the rest of his days, continuing his natural history research. He himself begins to get recognized for his work, and in 1667, he becomes a fellow of the Royal Society of London. So what do they do? Ray writes very extensively, not only his own work, but he also takes pains to finish unfinished works by Francis Willoughby and publish them under his name. 
so under Willoughby's name I mean so Ray is giving props to Willoughby where they were due as far as we can tell he was always very grateful to his young patron and made sure that Willoughby got credit for the research that he had done. Now Ray's most prominent work is a three-volume work called History of Plants published between 1686 and 1704. <coughs> In that work Ray classifies and describes more than 18,000 types of plants. He is, as I mentioned, upset by the lack of a classification scheme for the living world, and he introduces his own basic taxonomy. He's considered one of the fathers of modern taxonomy, although we do not use Ray's taxonomic system today, he does give us a couple of concepts that we do in fact still use. Namely, uh, Ray gives us the idea of the species. Uh, Ray is going to write about the concept of the species, which he defines as that which is never born from the seed of another species. And obviously this is an important distinction to make in biology. He's not the first person to think in terms of this kind of classification scheme. Uh, the uh, concept of um, the genus uh, is going to come about the same time period from two Swiss botanists, the brothers Gaspard and Johann Bauhin, uh, and Ray is going to fold their genus concept into his work as well. So we're going to have the first use of genus and species, the binomial, as we sometimes call it, uh, as a way of describing living things. And Ray applies this primarily to the plant world, but also some to the animal world. He introduces the first concept of morphological taxonomy, that is classifying living things based on their observed structural or morphological features, rather than trying to classify them on the basis of habitats as had been previously done. For example, a lot of medieval bestiaries would classify living things on like, here are things that fly or here are things that live in the water, you know, which meant that you ended up with classifications that included fishes, ducks, and beavers, all in one heading as things that lived in the water. Fun fact for you, since we are in Lent right now, uh, if any of you are still observing Lent during this current crisis, I think the Pope said you don't have to anymore because we're all sacrificing enough as it is during the pandemic, uh, but <coughs> if you are an observant Catholic during Lent, you are allowed to eat beaver meat during Lent on Fridays, because according to ancient uh, Catholic doctrine in medieval bestiaries, a beaver is classified as a fish because it lives in water. And therefore, uh, you have special dispensation to eat beaver meat uh, on Friday during Lent, should you you know, be lost in the Canadian wilderness and concerned about what you, need, what you eat on a Friday and you find a beaver meat, I guess. That was actually introduced for that reason. Basically, it was a provision put into Catholic law whenever French explorers were exploring in uh, the interior of the Americas and what is now Quebec in Canada. Uh, they were scrounging for food they could eat on Fridays, trying to be observant in their Lenten uh, fasting during uh, their explorations far out in the wilderness. And the Catholic Church decided to issue a special dispensation saying, all right, well, according to this old medieval bestiary that we found dusting off on a shelf somewhere, um, beavers are fish, so fish are okay to eat on Fridays, so you can eat a beaver if you find one out in the Canadian wilderness. But anyhow, though, uh, so Willoughby uh, is going to give us instead morphological taxon, so classifying living things based on their features, their anatomical and structural features, not on the basis of where they live or how they behave or things like that. Willoughby is also going to publish several zoological works. Uh, he is going to finish works by Willoughby that Willoughby left unfinished at the time of his death and publish them with Willoughby as primary author. Among other things, uh, Ray is going to publish The Ornithology, which is the first work on that particular subdiscipline of biology and the science of birds. And he's going to publish Willoughby's most infamous work. I've mentioned it in here before, History of Fishes, which you might recall, History of Fishes uh, was going to be the book that in 1686 almost prevented Newton's Principia from being published because History of Fishes ate up the entire Royal Society of London's publication budget for that year since it was this lavish full color text and the Royal had blown its pu publishing money 
Newton approached them with the Principia. They said, well, damn, we can't really publish this cool physics book because we already spent our entire publishing budget on this awesome book called History of Fishes. Incidentally, you want a book about fish? Newton didn't want a book about fish. Um, but and then Newton, for his part, kind of echoing uh, Ray's life, only got to publish the Principia because he t had it privately funded by his young patron, Edmund Holley. So circle repeats itself. Uh, both Ornithology and History of Fishes admittedly were primarily Ray's work. Willoughby had them in loose note form, uh, not well formulated and certainly not finished. Ray pulled them together and authored most of them, quite frankly, but still, I think it was fair, gave Willoughby uh, authorial credit on them. So John Ray has not made any dramatic discoveries. He has given us the concept of the species as a unit of classification, that's super important. He has given us the concept of field study, which is super important, and he's given us the concept of morphological taxonomy. So again, like Tycho Brahe, he's not given us massive theoretical advances, but he has established some really important data points and some really important classification schema that are going to help everybody who comes after him. I should point out that Ray also working at about the same time that Nicholas Steno was doing his work and about the same time that uh, Robert Hooke was first working with them, Ray also, in the course of his natural history study, stumbled upon fossils. And Ray noted, ah, once in a while I find a rock that looks like a former living thing. Here are some rocks um, that look like shells or look like bones. And some of these rocks that look like shells or fish are far from the ocean. Huh. I wonder how that happened. Ray never offers a theory on the origins of fossils, but he definitely brings attention to the phenomenon. So he's going to be establishing some important foundational stuff for natural history, and I think he deserves some important props for that, and Willoughby along with him. Now, next fellow on our list is not a well-known figure in the history of science. We talk about him sometimes, those of you who are into the history of primatology or uh, paleoanthropology which I guess is probably only me in this discussion. But uh, anyhow, though, let's talk about a guy who is not a well-known figure, but ends up being important to our story. An English physician by the name of Edward Tyson. Tyson is born in 1650, dies in 1708. He's considered the father of modern comparative anatomy. Tyson is a hospital physician. Uh, he is educated at Oxford and Cambridge and becomes the chief physician at Bethlehem Hospital in London. Some of you might have heard of Bethlehem Hospital before. It was more known by a much uh, less flattering nickname. It was called Bedlam. And Bedlam was the most notorious mental hospital of its time. It should be understood that mental hospitals in the 16 and 1700s were essentially prisons for the mentally ill. There was very little concept of treatment for mental illness. Uh, there was a general belief that if you were mentally ill, that it was for one of two reasons. Either one, you were possessed by a demon or the devil, in which case it was your own fault for being a sinner, or you were of weak moral character, in which case it was also your own fault for being a sinner. So basically the idea uh, held by most folks in the 1600s, and I hate to say it, but this is an idea that tended to persist well into the 1900s, was that if you were mentally ill, it was your own fault, because you were a bad person, or you were a weak person, or you were of poor character, and therefore that there was not a lot of sympathy for the mentally ill. We still see echoes of this today, folks. We still find mental illness not treated the same way as physical illness. We see, still see stigma surrounding mental illness. Any of you who suffer anxiety or depression or any other uh, problem along those lines are well aware of this, unfortunately, probably from personal experience. <clears throat> we still have debates, despite overwhelming empirical evidence, over whether or not addiction is in point of fact a physical disorder. It is. It's a chemical disorder of the brain. Uh, not everybody's equally susceptible to it. But uh, so we're still fighting this fight. But in the 1600s, basically nobody is thinking in terms of mental illness being really illness. The closest we come to treatment is humorism-based therapies, bleeding people to let out the bad blood, uh, that sort of thing. For the most part, mental hospitals are confining the mentally ill. Many of them are locked in cells like prisoners. 
uh, chained, straight-jacketed, subject to horrific abuse uh, from the people in charge. Uh, things that qualified as mental illness uh, were not always things uh, that, historically speaking, have uh, held up to being considered mental illness. Sometimes you were hospitalized for being mentally ill because you were epileptic and you had fits, as they called it in the day, or you were hospitalized for mental illness because you had radical political ideas or because you were an overly literate woman and that seemed like a violation of nature, you know, and things like that. So even a lot of folks who ended up in mental hospitals were not by modern understanding mentally ill, at least not when they went in, but the treatment they suffered there very well could have left them that way. So it was a horrible place to end up. Bedlam was particularly notorious uh, for the both uh, squalor and poor treatment of its inmates and also for the sensationalism of it. Bedlam had a common practice whereby rich people could come and visit the hospital, pay a penny to walk around and look at the patients like they were zoo animals. For an extra fee, they would give you a stick you could poke them. So, not a nice place. And I hate to say it, but this kind of attitude of the treatment of the mentally ill and of the poor conditions of mental hospitals is not really going to be seriously reformed until the late 19th, early 20th centuries. But, uh, Edward Tyson becomes the head hospital physician at Bedlam, and I'll give him some props as a pioneer in mental health services in that he believed that the mentally ill should be treated as if they were ill. In other words, treat them as sick people and try to find ways to make them better. Although admittedly most of Ray's treatments were humoristic in nature, he was at least approaching it as a medical problem rather than a confinement problem or a moral problem. He was also, history of nursing moment here, the first physician to hire female nurses for the taking care of patients as opposed to just having male orderlies to keep them in line. Now, when he's not tending to the hospital, Tyson, did I say Ray a minute ago? I meant Tyson, sorry. Um, Tyson is gaining some fame as a comparative anatomist. He does public dissections of a wide variety of animals and makes comparisons of them uh, to human anatomy. This is uh, a thing he becomes quite famous for and a reason why we call him the father of modern comparative anatomy. Uh, now his most famous dissection, and the one that is most important and germane to our discussion, in the year 1698, Tyson dissects a chimpanzee. The chimpanzee was brought back by explorers from the interior of Africa, preserved in a barrel of vinegar, uh, and Tyson uh, laid it out and dissected it, and made some comparative studies of that chimp to other animals with roughly similar anatomy. He ends up publishing a monograph on his findings. Uh, the title is instructive. The title of this monograph is Orangutan, or Homo Sylvestris, or The Anatomy of a Pygmy, compared with that of a monkey, an ape, and a man. There's a lot going on in this title. Let's pick that apart for a minute. So first off, orangutan or homo sylvestris. Homo sylvestris, uh, the usage here is uh, kind of a uh, shaky usage by our modern standards. Sylvestris is the species name of the most common variety of orangutan that we know today, uh, although it's not homo anymore. It is pongo sylvestris. Um, <clears throat> but he's trying to apply a binomial name to it. Uh, he's calling this chimp an orangutan. Now, this is because you have a phenomenon whereby the great apes are a relatively new discovery in this time. It's only by about the late 1600s that European explorers have spread out enough into Africa and Southeast Asia to be aware of various great apes being out there. And therefore, not many people have ever seen one at all. Probably nobody has ever seen more than one kind. And therefore, Tyson is misidentifying his chimpanzee as being the same kind of animal as an orangutan, where they in fact live on completely different continents. It's a forgivable mistake for his time period, but he doesn't call it a chimpanzee. Now, in the rest of that, he says the anatomy of a pygmy compared with that of a monkey, an ape, and a man. Now, the monkey in his comparison is uh, a capuchin monkey from India. The ape in his comparison 
is actually not an ape by our modern definition of the term. Uh, the ape in this comparison is an uh, animal called the Barbary ape from northern Africa, which we now know as a type of baboon. The man is obvious. But how about that term pig, which he spells in his work P-Y-G-M-I-E? The word pygmy, as we understand it today, refers to certain tribes from the interior of Africa uh, that have a uh, genetic uh, predisposition to very short height, not dwarfism, just the very low end of the normal range of adult human height. Uh, in your average pygmy tribes, an adult height of between four feet and four foot six is not at all unusual. Um, now, the pygmies were peoples that were being encountered by European explorers for the first time in the 1600s as Europe began conquering and colonizing Africa. Now, you note that Tyson calls his animal here a pygmy. Chimpanzees have also been encountered in the interior of Africa by European explorers. I am sorry to report that as far as the average European explorer delving into Central Africa was concerned, there was no meaningful difference. We're seeing a horrifically racist attitude in this time period. Black slavery is a thriving industry. Europe is cheerfully conquering the African continent and exploiting it for uh, its resources. And the native peoples are needless to say, not being treated terribly well. And yeah, as far as most Europeans were concerned, the differences between chimpanzees as we know them today and pygmy tribesmen were not important because they thought of them as basically being the same kind of primitive beast. And you have some terrible, terrible accounts that come out of this time period. Uh, I read an account by a ship captain, a uh, sailor, an English captain who uh, was trading out of the interior of Africa, and he had uh, on his ship a pet chimpanzee, a uh, pet pygmy, as he called his creature. Uh, by the name of Jack. And he talked in his uh, journals about what a clever little animal Jack was. And he was so happy to have such a clever little beast in his possession that he had taught Jack to do all sorts of tricks. He had taught Jack to eat with a spoon. He had taught Jack to smoke a pipe. He had taught Jack to say the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. The clever little ape was not a chimpanzee. And I hate to say it, but this is an attitude that's going to persist. And the idea that native Africans were, in fact, basically the same sort of thing as the apes is going to remain. And it's going to be used as part of an attitude to dehumanize. I'm not rooting that in Tyson. He was certainly not the originator of this idea. He is echoing the language of his time period. But it's an attitude that will persist. You will still find racist comparisons of those of African heritage to apes to this day, which I'm sure some of you are well aware of. But it's an attitude that in this time is pervasive, and we see echoes of it here. Anyhow, Tyson is dissecting an actual chimpanzee, although he's calling an orangutan. And as he does so, <clears throat> he notes the remarkable number of similarities in the anatomy of this creature to the anatomy of human beings. And he concludes that humans and chimps have more features in common with each other than either of them does with any other comparable animal. That uh, in his comparison of monkey, ape, man, and chimpanzee, chimp and human have the greatest similarity. He notes more than 30 distinct points of anatomical comparison upon which the two are similar, especially noting similarity in the structure of the hands and of the brain which are obviously the chief adaptations of our species uh, to its remarkable evolutionary success. Now Tyson in his work basically says, huh, isn't it an odd thing that the Lord God thought to use the same basic blueprint to build this little ape as he used to build us? He doesn't come to the logical conclusion that we can arrive at here that the chimp is in fact a relative of ours, that it's our closest living relative. But he's the first to make that uh, observation and other people are going to pick up on the idea that he is glossing over. And that brings us to a fellow you've almost certainly heard of if you've taken biology for long enough, a Swedish botanist by the name of Carl von Linné, V-O-N, not capitalized, and capitalized L-I-N-N-E, although he is better known by the Latinized form of his name, 
Carolus Linnaeus, L-I-N-N-A-E-U-S. Linnaeus is the name that is almost always used for him in science history. You probably know him by that name because uh, that's the name he used throughout his professional career. Among other things, Linnaeus was one of the last scientists to write in Latin as opposed to writing in the vernacular. Linnaeus was born in 1707, uh, died in 1778, uh, native of Sweden. Uh, his father was a Lutheran clergyman. <clears throat> he attended uh, the University of Uppsala uh, in Sweden, um, got his MD there, uh, conducted uh, botanical research in his time at Uppsala. Uh, after he uh, finished his work there, he actually traveled into the northern regions of Scandinavia, conducting surveys of the native plant life. Eventually, uh, was, uh, Linnaeus is going to return to Uppsala. He's going to become chair of botany there in 1742 and will hold that position for the remainder of his life. By all accounts, Linnaeus was a nice guy. He was supposedly very charming, very easy to get along with, good guy to have at parties, uh, loved to talk and engage with people. His students loved him. He was apparently a pretty good dude. Bit of an ego on him. He wrote four autobiographies during his lifetime. And had he been alive today, Linnaeus would have probably been considered severely obsessive compulsive. <coughs> Linnaeus was obsessed with the idea of classification and taxonomy. He wanted everything in the world sorted into neat little boxes. He wanted everything categorized nicely. He had notebooks in which he had developed taxonomic schemes for everything from the types of pebbles in the university garden path to the kinds of spoons in his kitchen. And fortunately for all of us, Linnaeus applied that obsession with classification to the living world. He was deeply unsatisfied by the taxonomies for animals and plants available in his own time. He was inspired by Ray, but he felt that Ray's system didn't go far enough. And therefore, Linnaeus set out to build a more comprehensive, universal taxonomy that could be applied not just to plants or just to animals, but to all living things. So Linnaeus uh, is going to begin his work uh, before he even has his chair at Uppsala. In the year 1735, he is going to publish Systema Naturae. S-Y-S-T-E-M-A, Naturae, N-A-T-U-R-A-E. Published the first volume of that in 1735. He publishes 13 editions of the book up through the year 1770. The initial book is a little more than a pamphlet. It's 11 pages long. By the final edition, he has written a 3,000 page work that classifies more than 4,400 varieties of animals and almost 8,000 varieties of plants, about 7,700 plant varietals found in there. He also includes a taxonomy for the mineral world, I should say, uh, although his mineral taxonomy is no longer in use. We don't have, we don't use the system for that anymore. Now Linnaeus's classification system is probably familiar to many of you already because it's the one we still use. It is called after him Linnaean taxonomy. And although we've elaborated upon it since his time, we've built on it, we've changed it up in some ways, the basic model that he laid down is still the chief taxonomic system employed by the biological sciences. In Linnaeus's taxonomy, living things are categorized on two bases. One, shared morphological or anatomical traits, an idea that he borrows from John Ray, but two, based on shared reproductive methods. So the idea is not just that living things are classified together because they have similar features, it is because they have similar features because they got them from a common ancestor, that living things that have similar models of reproduction are passing on their features in the same way. And therefore, Linnaeus is the first to posit that, okay, all birds, have similar bird features because they got them from a bird ancestor. So Linnaeus is talking about common ancestry for related groups of living things. Now, the way Linnaean taxonomy works when he writes it 
is that he divides all living things up into a couple of broad groups that he calls kingdoms. Then in each group, he splits them into smaller groups uh, that he calls classes. Uh, each class is then split into smaller groups called orders. Uh, each order is split into smaller groups called genera, which is the plural of genus, if you don't know that already, a uh, term that he borrowed from Ray and from the Bauhin brothers. Uh, and the, then finally, each genus is split into species, a concept, of course, that he borrowed from John Ray. I should point out he did not actually uh, credit um, the, the Bauhin brothers uh, for their concept of genus. He uses it, but he does not give credit to them. He does credit Ray for the concept of species. Now, that's only a five rank system. Uh, in modern Linnaean taxonomy has eight ranks. We have added the domain, uh, the phylum, and the family uh, to Linnaeus's original system. Plus, we have a lot of sub ranks of taxonomy and a lot of unranked groups of living things that are nonetheless sharing common relation. But each rank you go down on the scale, living things in that group resemble one another more closely and therefore are presumably more closely related. Linnaeus introduces the concept of the binomial nomenclature as the uh, standard way of talking about life. Uh, other people used it before him, but he establishes that as a named thing. The binomial nomenclature is a shorthand for a living thing when it's got a much more complex, complete name. Uh, he introduces thousands of taxonomic terms that we use today. Uh, a lot of basic terms that you know now, like primate or mammal, are terms that originated with him. Uh, he lays down the basic rules of systematics, that is, the basic rules of how we classify and name living things. Uh, he establishes the common tradition of deriving names for species from not Latin, but from Greek. A lot of people get that wrong. Greek is what you're supposed to be using in deriving your taxonomic names. That is a rule that is often broken in modern taxonomy, but it is technically uh, what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, he names thousands upon thousands of organisms. And indeed, many of Linnaeus's names are still in use today. He establishes the concept of the holotype, H-O-L-O-T-Y-P-E, which you in biology might know as the type specimen. That is designating, here is my kind of descriptive specimen. This is my example that I use to describe the features of this species. Uh, not necessarily the first one discovered, but uh, a lot of times it is, but it's uh, the first example that we use in saying, okay, this is what it is like to be this kind of animal or this kind of plant. Here are its features. This is the specific specimen that I am basing my description upon. And a lot of natural history collections throughout Europe contain type specimens. If you go to Sweden today, you can visit the Linnaeus Museum at Uppsala, which contains the type specimens of thousands of plants and animals that you encounter on a daily, daily basis. Now, Linnaeus's taxonomy uh, is revolutionary uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, it's really giving order to the biological world in a way that is much more empirically consistent than anything we've done previously. It's giving us a system for classifying and naming living things in which we can say, okay, this newly discovered living thing actually fits into an existing group. We can see that this thing is a reptile or we can see that this thing uh, is a member of, you know, the family carnivora or order carnivora or, you know, whatever other group we're going to apply it to. We can look at features of an existing living thing and say, oh yeah, either that fits into a group we've already got or we have to designate a new group for it. It also gives us the all important idea of living things deriving shared features from common ancestors. Those of you who know your evolutionary science know about homology in evolution, the idea of how important it is to look to common ancestry as a source of shared features in living things that are related to one another. But he also does one other thing that's a little more subtle, but very important. Linnaeus defines a lot of groups of living things. He defines the order primates, the primates, as a group of living things. And in the order primates, he puts a number of different organisms. He puts apes, he puts monkeys, he puts bats incorrectly. That's been taken out. We've changed some of his classifications over time. But he also puts us. Linnaeus classifies human beings. Genus Homo, species Sapiens. Homo sapiens, the wise man. 
homo for man, sapiens for wisdom or knowledge. S-A-P-I-E-N-S. -E the S is part of the word. It's not a plural form. One of you is not a homo sapien. He also gives us a common convention we still use in biology today, that when you're writing genus or species name, you capitalize genus but not species, and you italicize or underline both genus and species. Common convention in biology. But yeah, Homo sapiens, he classifies us. And he classifies us the exact same way as he classifies every other living thing. In other words, Linnaeus is not carving out a special exception for humans. He's not putting us up and above everything else like Aristotle's scale and mature. He's not putting us off into our own little special side group because we are smart or cool. He is lumping us in with every other animal. We are mammals, we are animals, we are primates. We fit into a group because we share common features with all those things. We have features that make us a mammal. We have features like these opposable thumbs that make us a primate. We have features that put us among the other apes. And that is revolutionary because Linnaeus is putting us into the living world, not as an exception to it, not as a thing standing outside or above it, but as a distinct part of it. And that's a really, really important step in moving forward. Now, you might have noticed, if you're thinking about all this, that inherent in Linnaeus's work is a concept of evolution, right? That after all, if living things have shared features from a common ancestor, clearly something had to change along the way between the common ancestor and today to make the blue jay and the cardinal different from one another. So implicit in Linnaeus's work is a concept of evolutionary change that whatever the common ancestors were of living things had to in some way change over time to give rise to the variations we see now. Linnaeus never explicitly says that. He never comes out and says those words in his work. He just leaves the taxonomic system there hanging as it is. But other people can fill in the cracks. Other people can look at this and deduce what must be true if Linnaeus's taxonomy is valid. And Linnaeus himself is very bothered by this because he knows how his taxonomy works. He is confident in his system, and yet he just used it to classify humans as primates. He's a deeply religious man. He's a very devout Lutheran, and he is really, really bothered by this notion. He writes in a letter to one of his colleagues, and I will quote here from his letter, It is not pleasing that I place man among the primates. But man is intimately familiar with himself. Let's not quibble over words. It will be the same to me whatever name we use. But I request from you and from the whole world the generic difference between man and simian, and this from the principles of natural history. I certainly know of none. If only someone might tell me just one. If I call a man a simian, an ape, or vice versa, I would bring together all the theologians against me. Perhaps I ought to, in accordance with the laws of the discipline of natural history. Linnaeus knew. His own work had shown him that, clearly, humans were part of a living world that was not static. And he really, really didn't like that idea. So he never openly publishes it. By the end of his life, he is convinced that some kind of evolutionary process is at work. He is convinced that the world must be older than 6,000 BCE. He still buys into the idea of a great flood that shaped the world and left behind fossils. Uh, and he's the first to suggest um, that fossil life is the remnants of, you know, uh, things that died in the great flood. But he never actually comes out and publishes that idea. One last ugly postscript to the life of Linnaeus. In later editions of the Systema Naturae, he classifies human races, and he begins saying, oh, humans are divided into more than one kind, and he designates several races of man. He talks about Homo afer, A-F-E-R, the native peoples of Africa, Homo Americanus, Native Americans, Homo Asiaticus, folks of Asians, descent, and Homo Europeus, E-U-R-O-P-A-E-U-S. That is Europeans or white people, really. His descriptions. Now, 
he wrote a description for every species. One of the things that Linnaeus does, and that it's still true in that modern taxonomy, that when you designate a species and you designate a holotype, you write a description of it. You formally describe it and say, here are the features that designate that thing. One of my favorite facts about the Systema Naturae is that his description of Homo sapiens is the shortest one in the entire book. It's two words, know thyself. He refused to designate a type specimen for humanity. He ab ab explicitly did not choose a specific human as a type specimen. And he said, as a description of what we are, he did not make a list of features that made you human. He just said, know thyself. Uh, his descriptions of human races are not as good. Among other things, uh, when he's describing Homo affair, the native peoples of Africa, his description describes them. And these are, this is meant to be a biological description, mind you, designating the biological features by which you can identify the organism. Homo affair, he says, is, quote, black, impassive, lazy, crafty, slow, and foolish. Homo asiaticus is, quote, yellow, melancholy, greedy, severe, haughty, and desirous. Homo Americanus is, quote, red, ill-tempered, obstinate, contented, free, and he includes the footnote, uh, smears himself with grease. Homo Europeus is, quote, white, serious, strong, hair blonde and flowing, eyes blue, active, very smart and inventive. Well, you might detect a little hint of bias in these descriptions. And I am sorry to report that this is going to be the beginning of a long and ugly history of using taxonomy to designate humans in distinct racial groups, some of which are perceived as biologically inferior to one another. The idea of race as a biological construct persists into the 1970s and it's not finally deconstructed until the late 20th century. We now understand that race literally does not exist as a biological phenomenon. It is a cultural rather than a biological reality. But nonetheless, this idea of the perceived biological separations of humans into distinct populations is going to persist for a long time, both in and outside of science, and it's going to be used to justify everything from Jim Crow laws to the uh, final solution of Hitler, the idea that certain groups of humans are inherently biologically superior or inferior to others. And although Linnaeus was not designating that sort of thing, he was not advocating that, his classification schema is where we start seeing the beginning of that scientific racism. He also, by the way, designates two other categories, Homo sapiens monstrosus, uh, which he uses to include any kind of monstrous human, among other things. He says giants fit into this category. Dwarves fit into this category. Wild men, as he puts them, fit into this category. And what he perceives as genetic freaks. Uh, like, you know, abnormal anatomy. Uh, he also designates Homo anthropomorpha uh, for mythical creatures that are part human, like centaurs or satyrs, you know, uh, that uh, are still out there in the world. And Linnaeus says these things actually exist, but he says that we're making mistakes, that they're actually types of apes. By the way, I want a little footnote on Linnaeus's career. Uh, he spends uh, a lot of time debunking supposed mythological creatures. He actually uh, is a guy that you call in when somebody claims that they have the body of a chimera or a hydra or some other mythological beast. And he's the guy who comes in and looks at it and says, no, this is just clever taxidermy. You're a fraud. I've got an article about that in the uh, article section on the Blackboard site if you're in the class and you want to go check that out. He also, uh, towards the end of his life, revises the temperature scale introduced by a fellow Swedish scholar named Anders Celsius. Uh, Celsius had built a uh, temperature scale in which he designated 100 as the freezing point of water and zero as the boiling point. Linnaeus is going to revise that scale and reverse it and say, no, it makes a lot more sense for zero to be where water freezes and 100 to be where it boils. Okay, so that is our buddy, Carlos Linnaeus. We're starting to establish some evolutionary principles. Now, how about, let's shift gears. Let's go to France. France is going to be the center of a lot of good natural history research during the 1700s, French Academy of Sciences, 
uh, makes this a good place to do that work. And several French scientists are going to really uh, make their names in the study of natural history. Among those is a fellow by the name of Georges Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon. It's G E O R G E S dash L O U I S. Leclerc, L E C L E R C. Uh, his title, Comte de Buffon, Count of Buffon, C O M T E, D D E, Buffon, B U F F O N. So Georges Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, a lot of natural history texts call him George Buffon. That's a name you'll often see him referred to by. The, uh, Buffon is often listed incorrectly as his last name, but you'll see that a lot more than Leclerc. Buffon is born in 1707, uh, dies in 1788. He's one of the foremost naturalists of the 18th century. Uh, he is a native of France born to vast wealth. His family owns huge tracts of farmland and vineyards and so forth. Uh, he inherits his family estates at the age of 25, uh, spends several years traveling Europe, studying medicine and natural philosophy at various universities, uh, never obtains any kind of degrees. After he inherits his family lands at 25, he never travels city further than the city of Paris again, and basically devotes most of his time to the tending of his land, to the maintenance of his properties, to trying to find ways to improve them and to improve the lives of the people who are tenants on his land, uh, and to natural history. He basically only comes to Paris whenever it's time for meetings of the French Academy of Sciences or to give demonstrations of phenomena in the natural history sciences. Buffon is deeply devoted to both scientific study and to the people that are on the lands that he owns. He uh, is always trying to find ways to improve uh, the farming yield and improve the lives of the peasants. Uh, he travels around his lands regularly, personally inspecting them and talking with people and seeing what they need. Pretty good guy by all accounts. He keeps to a very rigorous schedule. Uh, Buffon uh, pays a peasant to drag him out of bed every morning at 5 a.m. so that he doesn't lose good daylight. And he keeps a strict regimented routine where he's got blocks of time set aside in his day for inspection of the lands, for seeing visitors, for reading, for scientific experimentation, for meals, for prayers, for all the different parts of his day, neatly regimented, blocked in, and he holds to this very strict schedule for more than 50 years. In fact, when some very distinguished American natural philosophers by the names of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson come to France to visit him, they arrive at Buffon's home in the morning and they have to wait for him for seven hours because it wasn't yet the time of the day to receive visitors and he had stuff he had to do. So Buffon is going to be dedicated to the popularization of science. He wants ordinary people to understand science and he wants to write about it in language that ordinary people can understand. He becomes a very popular science author, one of the first popular science writers. He famously demonstrates that Archimedes' death ray in Paris in 1747 shows that he can burn wood with a mirror from a distance of 200 feet away. Now, much of his life is going to be dedicated to a massive 44-volume work called Historie Naturelle Générale et Particulaire, or Natural History, General and Particular which he publishes in 44 volumes between 1749 and 1804, the last eight volumes being published posthumously. In his Natural History General and Particular, Buffon summarizes basically everything known about the life and earth sciences in his day. Very widely read scientific work, not only by fellow scientists, but also by the public. It is considered the go-to reference for the study of natural history. If you're a scientist and interested in natural history, you are reading uh, Buffon's work. Uh, a lot of schoolboys are reading his work, and indeed a lot of scientists cite him as an inspiration, someone that they read when they were young that got them interested in pursuing the study of natural history. Now, he introduces some really important ideas. A lot of this is kind of encyclopedic. He's listing discoveries of other people, but he also introduces some of his own concepts. Uh, he introduces the very important notion in evolutionary science of biogeography, namely that different uh, species are adapted to 
their particular environments in particular ways, that you can see a distribution of species across landforms, and that different regions have distinct flora and fauna that came from a common ancestral source. Very important idea in evolutionary science. He also talks about evolution, doesn't call it that, but he is talking about change in species over time. He accepts the idea of divine creation, but he does not accept the idea that life is static, that life must have changed over time. He says that vestigial body parts are proof that life has changed, that they are the remnants of features that at one time were useful. And he discusses a kind of evolution in which he says that God created all life, and from there, living things either degenerated or improved, that they got better or worse over time. He applies this to human beings. And incidentally, he says that we were created by God in our best form, and we have since degenerated, that humans have degenerated and become less good over time. So his evolutionary uh, model includes a concept of regression. Incidentally, and unsurprisingly, he is going to suggest that different kinds of humans have degenerated at different rates, and certain races of people are less degenerate than others. I don't think I need to tell you which ones he thought were the good ones. Now, he also introduces some concepts important to the geological sciences. He denies the reality of the Great Flood, saying that the landforms that we see around us cannot be meaningfully accounted for with that singular event. He proposes a creation of the earth based on natural rather than supernatural principles, suggesting that the earth was once part of the sun. He says that it broke off from the sun when the sun was struck by a comet and then fell into orbit and gradually cooled off. And on that basis, he attempts to figure out how old the earth is by making a scale model of the earth out of iron, heating it up to great temperatures, and seeing how long it takes to cool, and then extrapolating that to an object with the known circumference of the Earth to figure out how long it would take for that to cool off. On the basis of this uh, sort of deductive analogy experiment, uh, Buffon concludes that the Earth is about 75,000 years old. It does not make him popular by the Church. He himself is uh, still a believer in God, but the Church does not like what he has to say. Incidentally, I should point out a fun little fact about Buffon's calculation of the age of the Earth there, uh, that he made a math error in it, even by his own system. And let's be honest, his system is a somewhat flawed system, not exactly the best way of calculating the age of the planet, it didn't work that way. Um, but uh, you can see the logic behind it. But uh, the French mathematician Jean Fourier, who some of you might know of, F-O-U-R-I-E-R, -E Fourier transformations, you might know from your calculus class, uh, Fourier got his hands on some of Buffon's notebooks and uh, said, hey, Mr. Buffon made a math error in his attempt to calculate the age of the Earth. He redid Buffon's calculation on the basis of the, uh, removing the mathematical error and concludes that on the basis of Buffon's math, comparing that cooling ball of iron to the size of the whole planet, uh, that's in point of fact, by Buffon's math, the Earth is not 75,000 years old, it is 100 million years old. Fourier is so bothered by the implications of that high number that he actually buries the journal of Buffon's that the calculation was originally in, and he refuses to publish his own finding, although we know about it from his journals. So Buffon is going to be a big figure in early natural history. He's laying down some really important evolutionary concepts. He is beginning the process of serious scientific inquiry into how life might change over time. He is beginning the process of serious um, skepticism about the recent age of the Earth, suggesting a much older planet. And he is popularizing science and the idea of the general public. He's getting a whole generation of young men, including such people as Darwin and Charles Lyell, interested in science through his writings. And he's getting ordinary people more science literate through his works, which are deliberately written in accessible language. Okay, so uh, we have a bit more to go. I want to talk a little bit more about some pure geology in the near future here. But I've been going for about an hour and a half, probably a good time to take a little bit of a breather. So we're going to stop this particular part of the lesson here. In part two, we're going to pick up talking about the origins of modern geology. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, 
the uh, beginnings of calling our field biology, and we're going to start digging a little bit deeper into some evolutionary stuff, including some stuff about a fellow by the name of Darwin. Actually, two fellows by the name of Darwin, but I'll tell you about both of them after our little break. I'll talk to you all soon.